Let's go to El Salvador now. El Salvador. El Salvador. The country was once the murder capital of the world. A place where criminal gangs control entire neighborhoods. Enter President Nayib Bukele, El Salvador himself. Imposing emergency security measures and giving police sweeping powers of arrest. He's very popular. I would imagine if you live in a place like that and crime goes down by 58%, you would be popular. But the United Nations, among others, say the measures have come at the expense of human rights. For decades, gang violence had made El Salvador one of the most dangerous countries in the world. Then came along Naib Bukele, the populist president, has implemented his iron fist policy, arresting tens of thousands of gang members. It sent his popularity skyrocketing with an approval rating of around 90%. But his critics accuse him of endorsing brutality, human rights abuses, and increasing authoritarianism. <laughs> This is how El Salvador is dealing with its gang problem. Thousands of suspected members being held without charge, soon to be dealt with in mass trials. More than 70,000 people have been arrested as part of President Nayib Bukele's war on gangs. 70,000 people in just four years. Bukele describes himself in joking terms as a dictator. In fact, the world's coolest dictator, a philosopher king. He's one of Latin America's youngest leaders and certainly the most popular, thanks to his efforts to end the power of the gangs. El Salvador is a small country, bordering Guatemala and Honduras, rarely in the news, and when it is, it's bad news. For decades, thousands of Salvadorians have fled the country in search of a better life in the United States, forming migrant caravans all the way to the border. They were fleeing one of the few things El Salvador is famous for, criminal gang MS-13. You know about MS-13? Thanks to the actions of MS-13 and Biro-18, El Salvador earned a reputation as one of the most dangerous places on Earth. 508 people have been killed only this month alone in El Salvador, the most violent country in the world. In 2015, the murder rate hit 105 in 100,000. That's more than 20 times that of the United States. But by 2022, it had become one of the safest countries in the region, with a rate of 7.6 murders per 100,000. It's all happened under the young president's watch. Bukele is from one of El Salvador's wealthiest family, a Christian with Palestinian heritage, a millennial who used to run a marketing company, and a former mayor of the capital, San Salvador. He had been a member of the center-left FLMN but he was expelled in 2017 after disputes with the leadership. He formed his own party, New Ideas, and in 2019 won the presidency. His party is certainly living up to its name, one of their headline policies making El Salvador the first country to accept Bitcoin as legal tender. I think around five million Salvadorans have been orange built right now. He's even pushing ahead with plans to build a Bitcoin mining city powered by geothermal energy because this is a fully, fully ecological city that work, works and is energized by a volcano. But it's just right in the side of the city. So it's a big city, everybody. He's also a prolific tweeter, preferring to get the message out on social media. Well over 80,000 tweets, far more than even Donald Trump. If you want to make a public statement, before, you call it press conference, right? I do press conferences very often. But right now you can do a statement with a tweet. And he prefers alternative media over the mainstream, appearing several times on Tucker Carlson's show on Fox while he still had one. You know, our country has failed to provide two basic things, which are the two main drivers of immigration, which is the lack of economic opportunity and the lack of security. He will say that under his reign, he's managed to change all of that. It's mostly down to what he calls his iron fist policy, built around improving security and ending gang warfare. In 2020, he asked for a loan from the United States to pay for the plan. The $109 million package had to be approved by El Salvador's parliament. When the main parties worried over potential overreach, he ordered the troops to change their minds. Last year, after 62 people were killed in a single day, he declared a state of emergency, which is still in effect. Some have accused him of being heavy-handed. Rights groups say thousands of young men have been arrested just for having tattoos, 
or for being from certain neighborhoods. Others accuse him of trying to become another Latin American strongman. He's already announced plans to seek a second term, even though the constitution bars presidents from running for consecutive terms. Bukele, though, is unlikely to take no for an answer and is already using his influence with the judiciary to give him the answer he wants. No tiene sentido. Por eso los países desarrollados sí tienen reelección. Y por eso, gracias a la nueva configuración de la institucionalidad democrática de nuestro país, ahora El Salvador lo tiene también. Well, joining me now are the Latin American experts Javier Farhe and Luke Taylor. We also have Noah Bullock, the executive director of Cristosal, an NGO based in El Salvador. And finally, we have the human rights expert, Carolina Jimenez. So welcome all four of you to the program. Noah Bullock, I'd like to start with you. The reason why we're covering uh, this president is because he has remarkably a huge popularity rating, 90%, and boasts that he has brought down murders by 92%. Um, are we to say then about him that he is an excellent president? Well, I think that um, the data, as you share, indicate that there's been a result from the security strategy uh, that President Bukele has driven. But I don't think it's a result that we can celebrate become, because uh, it's a strategy that has put at the core uh, the massive vi violations of human rights. Um, in the execution of the uh, state of exception in El Salvador, the Salvadoran government's rounded up over 70,000 people in sort of indiscriminate raids in communities and captured people without uh, due process, without prior investigation, without uh, judicial warrants, uh, and has put them in pres prison for indeterminate amounts of time while they're waiting trial. Uh, and once in prison, uh, tens of thousands of Salvadorans are uh, being subjected to systematic acts of torture. Uh, and some of those acts of torture uh, have led to the deaths of hundreds of Salvadorans. Our organizations have documented uh, at least 172,000 people who have died uh, in the custody of the state. Uh, and the images of the, the bodies that we've been able to document show signs of uh, gross torture, uh, people who have died as a consequence of lack of food and water that then uh, develop health issues, uh, the systematic denial of access to medical care itself for people with chronic illnesses, uh, physical disabilities and mental disabilities. So uh, to celebrate the results would mean that we would have to celebrate uh, what we consider to be crimes against humanity. Uh, and this strategy itself uh, is also pending on the dismantling of the democratic state. Uh, in no we, other country we, we'll, in the world. We'll, we'll come to that in just a second, um, if I may. Um, given that he has 90% popularity uh, apparently. I, I can't say that these statistics are necessarily reliable, but if he does have very high popularity, does that mean that the, the population of El Salvador approve of his iron fist policies, even though they know that some innocent people will be caught up in these arrests? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to look more deeply into the polls. Uh, when Salvadorans are asked if they support the state of exception, they say yes. And they say yes, rightly so, because Salvadorans support strong action from the government to dismantle criminal organizations. Uh, but when Salvadorans are asked about the specific measures that are violations of human rights, the support drops out. For example, um, in the case of arbitrary detentions, uh, only 20% of Salvadorans support that practice. Uh, the family members aren't informed by the states about the deaths of their family members. Uh, that's one that only 70% that 70 of Salvadorans say that they're opposed to. So there's a difference between supporting strong action against organized criminal groups uh, and the support that Salvadorans actually give to uh, the massive violations of human rights. Uh, I think that's an important distinction to make because there's a propaganda narrative that says that Salvadorans are willing to accept restrictions on certain liberties in exchange for security. Uh, they might be willing to do that, but it's not the uh, preferred option. And I think that's one of the things that this president needs to demonstrate is why was it necessary to use massive violations of human rights to achieve uh, some level of security for Salvadorans? Yeah, let me pose that question to you, if I may, Carolina. Um, he's managed to bring down the murder rate dramatically, but at what cost? At the cost of democracy. And that is a cost that no society should be paying. 
Uh, as we know uh, from the beginning, President Bukele has been a very good communicator. He uses social media constantly, but now he uses his social media to attack critics. And criticism and tolerance of criticism is, is at the core of democracy. He controls the judiciary. He changed the, you know, the, the key members of uh, the constitutional court, the attorney general, etc. And he also controls the National Assembly or Congress. So when you amass that amount of power, and you use that power to promote a security strategy uh, that violates human rights massively, as Noah was rightly uh, pointing out, I'm afraid that you have um, you know, threatened democracy in a way that it will be you know, difficult to recover democratic institutions. Uh, Luke Taylor, just looking at Bukele's uh, record on crime, are there other countries in the region that are looking at his model and thinking perhaps we should do that? Yes, I think Bukele's success and, and his massive approval ratings, which are the highest in the Americas now, um, have made candidates across the entire region realise that it could be a, a pathway to election, essentially. I mean, here in Colombia, with local elections coming up, um, it, it's quite clear that a lot of candidates have, have, have modelled their campaign and, and the idea of a hardline security programme on Bukele's uh, hope, in the hope that it will get win them votes. Um, but all across the region, um, particularly in Central America, which face very similar security issues and, and a lack of safety, and particularly in Ecuador, where um, the situation with gang violence is escalating pretty quickly, um, Bukele's model and, and, and uh, as I said, high, high, high approval ratings of, I think they're in the eighties or the nineties. Yeah. Um, mean that, that, that it's being replicated all across the Americas and, and his proposals too. So the idea of constructing mega jails, these hardline crackdowns using the military to um, encircle entire regions, all of this has suddenly become far more palatable and attractive to political candidates. And Javier Fahe, um, you, you've told me that he's extended the state of emergency numbers uh, a number of times, um, and people are becoming increasingly concerned about that. Why? I think because the problem is uh, that it has been extended for 12, 12 times. It was supposed to be an emergency uh, sort of measure, and then it has been extended for 12 times. But also what's worrying is about the tendency of Mr. Bukele to use this as a tool to stay longer in power than he should. This is this is this goes beyond fighting crime, which in which he has been actually successful. There's no question about that. And even the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights has acknowledged that it was important and it was necessary for the president to implement certain emergency sort of measures. But it has gone beyond that. Uh, for example, he has already announced that he wants to stand again as president, even though that goes against the Constitution. Uh, his party managed in Congress to change a law which prohibits uh, electoral reforms within a year of the elections. There's going to be elections in February next year, and in March, Congress decided to uh, put down that article that prohibits the government or, or any institution from introducing electoral reforms. He, this is a long-term project. This goes beyond fighting crime. Now, the problem as well, and I think um, Christo Sal has the reported really this very clearly, that many people who have nothing to do with crime have been arrested arbitrarily. Uh, farm workers, trade unionists, uh, human rights activists. This has gone beyond that because of the suspension of certain rights that people have uh, within the Constitution. This is what the emergency state is. That, that allows the state to arrest people without the mandate of a judge and to keep them in, in prison for longer than necessary. Yes. So this is going beyond crime. This is starting to put down people who do not agree with the government. And that is where the danger lays at the moment. Right. Uh, no, uh, Luke and Javier have mentioned the prisons. In fact, Luke mentioned the mega prisons. And the pictures of the prisoners you know, on their knees or sitting on the floor, all lined up together, it looks incredibly inhumane. It looks incredibly cramped. They're wearing... COVID masks, and they're all stuck together. Um, have you had a chance to visit any of these prisons? No, nobody has. That's part of the state of exception. Uh, the prisoners don't have access to family members, to their own legal defense. Uh, as far as we know, um, the Red Cross may have access, but they're not able to provide humanitarian assistance. Uh, the families bring 
Uh, they're responsible for bringing food, medicine, and clothing, but we know from testimonial accounts that rarely is actually given to prisoners. So the situation inside the prisons uh, is well guarded. The only access to knowing what's going on is through the testimonies of people who have been released. Uh, and I think there's an important connection that's being made here uh, between the state of exception and the political model that's being constructed. In El Salvador's history, uh, the only presidents that have sought re-election have been dictators, and those dictators have governed using states of emergencies throughout their entire terms. Do you think that, um, as Javier mentioned, he's seeking a second consecutive term, which isn't allowed under the current uh, electoral laws? Uh, first of all, do you think he will be successful in leaning on the judiciary and getting uh, the permission to, uh, to seek a, a second term? There's no more leaning on the judiciary. He controls it. Um, and once he gained a le legislative majority, the first action they did the very night of the new legislature was illegally and unconstitutionally overthrowing the constitutional court, which is one of the highest courts in the land. And then later there was a, a, another legislative action that effectively purged a third of the judges and put the rest of the judges in a situation where they could be removed from their jurisdictions with no cause. Uh, so the judiciary is ineffective. We've demonstrated this, for example, in presenting over 100 habeas corpus cases to the courts uh, on, on cases of people who pretrial detention uh, would affect their lives and livelihoods. I mentioned this earlier, people with uh, mm -hmm. physical and mental handicaps, chronic health issues, uh, and the court has not ruled on any of them. Uh, so basically, Salvadorans are without judicial protections, and that's one of the indicators of the collapse of the democratic state. Do you think a second Bukele term is inevitable then? I think that popularity uh, is a construction of power, and Bukele has absolute power in El Salvador. Uh, they have made reforms to even the political system uh, months before the elections, for example, uh, they reduced the municipalities from 262 to 44 and reduced the number of uh, congressional seats uh, down to uh, almost half. So these are actions oriented to consolidating power and using the electoral process uh, towards those ends. Uh, I can't predict the outcome of it. I know um, we have to believe in democracy up until the last moment. But I do think that conditions for free and fair elections in El Salvador have been uh, significantly uh, impacted. Carolina, you're watching this from DC. Uh, Bukele had a certain relationship with President Donald Trump and a very different relationship, it seems, with Biden. How would you characterize those two relationships? Well, clearly, uh, authoritarians uh, like each other. And we have learned that uh, in history. And I have to say that when you look at the relationship he had with President Trump and when you look at the relationship he, he now has with the current administration, there is a big difference, right? I mean, the previous administration, that of Donald Trump, was unwilling to criticize Bukele. On the contrary, he welcomed him uh, with open arms. And some uh, Republican senators, you know, have gone to El Salvador to meet with Bukele, etc. Uh, this uh, current uh, administration has been more critical of Bukele, and as we know, uh, it has imposed sanctions on some uh, close allies of President Bukele. So, the relationship with uh, under President, you know, Biden is is one of tension. Uh, but as you also know, the U.S. is is, uh, is having elections as well in 2024. So. We still need to see what the results of the U.S. elections will be, because that will very likely define the U.S. Uh, relationship towards, towards El Salvador and Central America in general. Javier Fahe, you were saying that, uh, that you know, a lot of the right-wing uh, governments in Latin America have been washed away, but this one sort of may give people sucker that uh, it's possible to return. Um, tell us more about that. Well, yes, some uh, politicians in Argentina and Chile, far-right politicians in Argentina and Chile, in the case of Argentina, Javier Millier, and in Chile, Jose Antonio Kess, who was a presidential candidate, um, they have already uh, picked up some of the ideas that uh, Bukele has in terms of the building of mega prisons and tra taking harsh measures against uh, street crime. And these uh, far-right populist policies could be part 
of a new agenda of the far right in, in South America. We mustn't forget that the far right has lost power. Bolsonaro is gone. Uh, the right-wing government in Colombia is gone. Uribe is more or less gone in Colombia. In Chile, the same thing. And also the far right needs uh, some kind of argument, some kind of uh, incentive for them to come back. And Bukele has become an inspiration for these far right politicians, in, especially in South America. And that makes it very dangerous because the problem of crime, street crime in these countries in Latin America is pretty serious at the moment. And this could appeal to many people in terms of uh, the harsh measures they will take. Uh, what people don't realize is that uh, what Bukele is doing, and it's being explained by other guests here, is taking measures to stay in power longer, changing the electoral law, uh, purging the judiciary, uh, you know, giving the armed forces excessive powers to repress, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, arbitrary detentions against opposition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these measures appeal to far right politicians in Latin America. And this could appeal to people who are fed up with crime, who are fed up with the establishment, if you like, or who might be tempted to vote for these kind of alternatives. That could be extremely dangerous because we saw what Bolsonaro did in, 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 in Brazil, and the consequences were very serious. And this could be sort of, yeah, uh, um, uh, this could galvanize the far right, which has been going down a bit in Latin America since the election of left wing leaders, and that might appeal to many people who are desperate to get rid of uh, a crime and, and some of the problems that societies face at the moment. Uh, Luke Taylor, do you agree that uh, if Bukele gets a second term, this might have wider implications politically in the region? It could have massive implications for the region because, as I said, it's already seen as a, a ticket to electoral success and popularity, um, and candidates are, are copying the Bukele model. Um, and obviously, the particularly worrying part is the idea of clamping down on on the gangs at all costs, right? So disregarding uh, the constitution or um, the right to trial or constitutional norms or whatever it may be, you know, whatever it takes, let's bring down the gangs. That's a very worrying model, and we have seen it across Latin America in the past. Um, and, and with, with the right being swept away across the region, it, it could be you know, the, the, a very simplistic and, and easy way for them to, to um, first of all, get elected and then also to, to um, seek popularity while, they, while they're in office. No, but uh, it looks at the moment that uh, Bukele has all the cards. Is there anyone or any type of force, you know, institutions that have any chance of providing that check and balance on him? Well, formal democratic institutions, no. Uh, the elections are maybe one of the last uh, opportunities to check power. Um, but I already mentioned that I think that the opportunity or the conditions for free and fair elections are compromised. Um, that having, sa having said that, uh, similar to other cases of authoritarian uh, governance, every day uh, the, the, the interests of the authoritarian government come into conflict with different sectors of society. Uh, so we see that happening in El Salvador as uh, the excesses and abuses of power impact different groups and societies. Uh, there's an increasing amount of protest. Recently, the doctors, for example, uh, were protesting mass firings, uh, uh, unions, the students at the National University. So this is unfortunately a pattern that we already know. I, I think that's something that needs to be um, emphasized here is that if there is a Bukele model, it's not a new model. This is the same model that we've seen from Fujimori uh, or other Salvadoran dictators uh, using heavy fisted uh, militarization of security, concentrating power. Uh, and then when popular support falls out, uh, having constructed uh, in the case of El Salvador with Nayib Bukele, an impressive repressive apparatus in order to quell dissent. Uh, and I think that that's what's happening right now with the state of exception, is it was proposed as a security strategy to dismantle gangs mm. and gang violence, uh, which is worth noting that El Salvador uh, at one point was the most violent country in the world, more violent than countries in armed conflict. But now with the, they have replaced gang violence with state violence. Uh, and state violence, uh, we can't find any references historically in the region where that has produced lasting peace. No, and, just, and just so a, a quick one before we end the show, but people will say at home, you know, he, he's done amazing things against MS-13 and other gangs. 
just quickly, was there another way to deal with them? There's always been another way. I think the model of President Bukele, if there is one, uh, would propose that the democratic state is insufficient to provide security, security for its citizens. Uh, and I think that's something that should be deeply concerning for uh, countries and leaders in the world of democratic vocation. Uh, what, what has lacked in El Salvador has never been militarization or, in the case of the, uh, the Bukele administration, corrupt negotiations with gangs. Those have been the un those have underpinned security strategy in El Salvador for 30 years. What's always lacked is an integrated security policy that uses the true power of the democratic state to provide well-being for its population. Noah Bullock and the rest of the panel, thank you so much for your contributions to the Nexus today. Much appreciated. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching. If you want to see this or any of our previous episodes, do go to our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Till next week then, goodbye. <laughs>